Hey guys, welcome back to Mastering Gaming Studios, and today we are going to discuss my GT that I went to. I guess it'd been a two weekends ago. Uh, I had some various things going on, so I wasn't able to record it just right away. After, however, we're going to talk about it now, and it's a pretty fun result. So we'll talk about all of that. Go into my list, the games I played, results, as you'll kind of see and a really cool result at the very end so definitely stay tuned to the end to see that uh, something I'm pretty proud of so before we dive in just want to remind you guys do like and subscribe to stay up to date on all of our content here at Maelstrom Games Dudes and if you want to help support the channel we have various links in the description down below we've got an Etsy shop we have an Element Games link and we have channel membership so thank you members all of that money goes right back into growing the channel making allowing us to make better content here for you so now with all that out of the way let's dive into today's video So just as a recap for you guys, I did make a video, it was probably was two weeks ago now, where I did talk about the prep going into this GT to see what, uh, what I, my list of what I was bringing, how I was preparing and such. But this was the Icebreaker GT here in Minnesota. We had five rounds of 56 players going at it here. Uh, they did end up with, because of the number of rounds and stuff, we did have two undefeated people at the end, but still there was crowned one winner as best general by point, by a single point actually. This was essentially my competitive send off for ninth edition. I might play in an RTT here or there uh, in May, but unlikely just because of things going on. We'll probably save the competitive for later down the road when 10th edition is up and running. So that is it. Some other notes of this, besides there being 56 players, is that there were two other tier players besides me, so more than I was actually anticipating. Uh, but they finished two and three and two and two. One of the guys had to leave early because weather started to get a bit, uh, bit hairy here, uh, as we are just getting out of winter season here. So we had a potential snowstorm coming, and uh, some people left. Well, I think they're the only two that left early. It wasn't that bad of a snowstorm, but either way. That is that. So that's why that score is two and two for the Tyrants. Now, we'll get into my stuff here. So if you didn't see the video already, this is my list. It was a Foot Tyrant who was my Warlord with the Shard Gullet, Lash Whip Bone Sword, Adrenal Glands, and Adaptive Biology for his Warlord trait. I brought the Swarm Lord, and I brought a Neurothrope with Direct Guidance. All three of them were awesome, awesome uh, characters. I really could not have done what I did without them throughout the game. The troops, the big, well, the fast movers of my army were the Hormagons, three units of 15 with toxin sacks. I am playing in Gorgon. I didn't, if you didn't catch that, being called the Gorgon Swarm, uh, with toxin sacks. I don't know if it was just playing in Gorgon, but I have to admit, I gave the toxin sacks somewhat of a bad rep for a lot of 9th edition and it wasn't until now that I started using them. I love it. Maybe only in Gorgon because then you have the strat to make them even better. But the Toxin Sacks do go a long way when it comes to attacking big units or high toughness units that you probably won't even be able to wound with poison because they're vehicles. Allowing you to have a full rerolls spend a CP to hit on five or to fives to hit auto wound and just fish for fives and sixes with a full reroll from Swarmy really does allow you to stack up the damage on some of those bigger units who don't expect it coming. So I like the Hormagons, though I will be honest, in four out of the five games I played, they did not do much of anything besides securing objectives and stuff like that. But they're absolutely crucial in the list. Elite choices. We had two individual lictors. Uh, I tried to play for behind enemy lines a lot. You'll see in the game, it didn't happen as much as I was anticipating, but I still like having them on the board to counter smaller screening threats, raise banners, do actions, lictors, just 
in your lines are still great for that. I had a single pyrovore, mainly for the same purpose as the Lictor, but just a cheaper option. You did fine. Can't really complain with the 40 points. For Tyrant Guard, they did what they were supposed to do, and that is die before the Tyrants die. We also had a Parasite of Mortrex. I went with the Gestation Sack. The Alien Cunning was great. I tried to keep track to see how often Alien Cunning would have been better over the Gestation Sack. And honestly, I only had one or two instances throughout all five games was like, yeah, would have been nice to have the, the Alien Cunning over it. But that Gestation Sack, having the extra unit of Rippers, if I was going for behind me lines, to help screen, to help absorb Overwatch or something, I liked having the Gestation Sack. Then the other meat of this list is the heavy support. Two units of two uh, Carnifexes with heavy Venom Cannons, Sighting Talons, and Enhanced Senses. I did pay 15 points to make one of them a Synapse Creature, and that did really help out, allowing me to just better chain my buffs and my synaptic imperatives and whatever it was around my psychic powers through the extra current effects. Uh, I used to have adrenal glands in the tyrant guard and then I realized after playing a full tournament and a half with forgetting about that they had adrenal glands they're not really that important on the tyrant guard so I dropped them for the synapse instead. Funny enough though, in the last game, uh, I did need that one extra inch on movement to get me extra primary points. Unfortunately, that didn't happen, but it is the way you play. Uh, some other important notes, I had one CP to start and my was playing with the Gorgon Adapter trait for reroll to wound. So let's get into the game. So again, this recap, five rounds. First one, this was rough, this was a Big 58-92 loss, and that includes the painting points. So I only got 48 points there to Dark Eldar. He had a lot of Incubi, a lot of warriors in various boats of shapes and sizes. Secondaries, I went, oh, and he had a, some pretty nasty characters too. Secondaries I went for is Cranial Feasting, Engage, and Warp Ritual. Uh, Engage was a horrible, this was, Taking Engage was probably the worst decision I made in the entire tournament. I should have gone for Grind and I probably would have picked up an extra 5 points, but still, in the grand scheme of things, it was still a, a brutal loss. The biggest thing, and my opponent totally agreed on this as the game had ended, there was so much train. Typically, at these Renegade and these Minnesota tournaments, we do like to play on the heavier side of terrain and it typically lines up to be about six pieces on terrain very standard uh, but our board had six very very large pieces with a lot of line of sight blocking to the point where i could not shoot any of his boats with more than two guns until turn three or four or whatever it was there was a lot of terrain and it made it very difficult and very advantageous for Dark Eldar. Not making excuses, but that was the situation I was in that I just did not have the firepower or the numbers to deal with the number of min squad units he had. The other thing that was really annoying was he had a ton of these special guns that targeted leadership and did mortal wounds in addition. And outside the tyrants, my army has very low leadership. So I was losing models, wounds left and right to these guns, unfortunately. Uh, I just, it was a well, well-made army. I think though in the end, he only ended up with two or three wins throughout the tournament. Um, yeah, two or three wins throughout the tournament, but I just, not gonna lie, I started that game, it was quite a quite a disappointing start and I felt a little disheartened but we do turn things around so game two against salamanders I'm not even giving an MVP for game one no one got MVP it was uh it's just bad overall maybe I'll give the pyrovore as he nuked five incubi with this flamer that's who will get it uh game two with the salamanders 
This was an 8976 win. He had dual land raiders with four centurions in each of them. Groups of inf infiltrators, uh, five, three groups of five. He had the character dread. I cannot remember his name, but it's a special salamander dreadnought, Forge World model. Not even a model, but Forge World character. Very nasty, nasty dreadnought in melee. Uh, he also had a tech marine and a apothecary. I think that's pretty much the list. Uh, in oh, and Dev Devastator Squad in Drop Pod. So I was, it started out very beginning good and then got pretty rough. Uh, I started the game with doing 15 wounds to a land raider with a shard gullet. However, land raiders have 16 and I could not touch that land raider until the end of the game and by then it was pretty much already back at full health. So that was unfortunate. Everything else, uh, Salamanders are really tough actually to deal with because they ignore AP minus one and they have a strat for plus one to their save. So my fully buffed Hormagon squad only managed to kill like two, two infiltrators on the charge. Uh, my Lictors really struggled at killing some of them because they just, they're tanky Salamanders are. They had a lot of flamers and melt though, which was not great for me. Uh, my secondaries, uh, Ritual, Banners, and Cranial Feasting. You can see that this is second game. Still haven't taken behind me lines, but I did go with Banners, Ritual. Uh, those, were, those were pretty easy points to get close to max on. I think I did like tw 12 of each or something. Or maybe it was 10 Banners and 12 Ritual. Uh, cranial Feasting has been one of these that I always have in my back pocket as a Tyranid player, and I think you should think about it if you have at least melee in your army, which pretty much every Tyranid army does. Killing the characters in melee, if your opponent has three or four characters, if you can kill them in melee, it's a lot of points, especially if you get that CP back and then tack on a few sergeants kills. It, it's a pretty easy one to get 10, 12 points, if not max out on it. So good there. It was, a, like I said, it was a pretty back and forth game, trading um, opponent, trading middle objectives. It was a six objective game. So we were trading a opposite end objectives. And I was down by a lot. However, I did have bottom of the turn. Uh, in turn five, I scored a whopping 29 points to give me the lead there. I got... 12 points for normal primary, 9 points for bonus primary, 5 points for ritual, and then what does that leave? 4 banner points or something? And I got a bunch of cranial feasting points because I saved my hormagons for the end of the game to do a turn one or a turn 5 charge across the board, killing a bunch of characters and stuff. Uh, MVP in this is tough. It went back and forth. It was probably between the Swarm Lord or the Foot Tyrant. Both of them held their own pretty evenly. Only the Swarm Lord survived on like a wound, but in the end they both did their damage and helped me out with the win there. Game three was versus Eldari, and this is the first time I had to play the Avatar of Kane, so I was pretty excited to see what he could do. This was a pretty bulky list. It, it was astonishing how few models he had in his army. So, it, uh, but yeah, so yeah, the Avatar of Cain, two Wraith Lords, two units of Wraith Blades. I have Wraith Guard, but Wraith Blades, the melee variants. Various Aspect Warriors. I had two units of, uh, two units of Spiders, which are terrifying. A unit of Banshees. He had some of the Shroud Runner bikes, and then various Farseers, Warlocks, and uh, Eldrad. And the Avatar, if I didn't say that already. Uh, for me, I took behind me lines, banners, and cranial feasting. This was data scry, so big deployment zones, uh, four objectives across the center, no man's land. Very tricky one to play, in my opinion. I knew his army was small, and he was deep striking a decent portion of it. So my game plan was to dominate that primary as early and often as I could. And that's pretty much when I did. I prevented him from getting more than four points, or I guess with the mission bonus, six points on primary. 
for every single turn. I did my best to gum him up and preventing him from getting onto his objectives. He also was a little more conservative in his movement than he probably needed to be in his first one. He waited until turn four to really send in the avatar. We talked after and I thought, yeah, you should have brought the avatar in right away. He is terrifying enough and he's got great durability against, uh, against the bugs. So that helped me in a way. Game MVP, again, no one super shined out more than the others, but it probably was going to be the Shard Gullet Tyrant. I, uh, I think he killed a Wraith Lord, the Falcon, and did a bunch of other damage to the Avatar and stuff. So not a huge one person stood out over the other, but if I had to pick one, I also tried. This is another game where my Hormagons just didn't do anything. Uh, I believe most of them got shot up by those annoying bikes with all their shuriken cannons or scatter I don't know what they have. Multiple shots, really good at killing them. Also with the warp spiders, just annihilating Hormagons. One squad can easily drop the 15 Hormagons if he rolls average. I believe, that, and then I also with one squad, tried to do a turn to across the map charge to try and take out his characters who were hiding in a building. They had Wraith Guard support or Wraith Blade support, but I thought they were deployed in such a way that if I got lucky, I could probably drop the Farseer and the Warlock and maybe a Wraith Blade or two. I ended up killing one Wraith Blade, the Warlock, and doing partial damage to the Farseer. The Lictor was later in the game able to finish off that Farseer. So give me a bunch of cranial feasting points there. Uh, but yeah, overall, a good win. A score was a little low for me. We were kind of rushed at the end of this game to uh, finish up. So we kind of had to play through or quickly play through turn five. Could have been a little bit cleaner. I probably could have, if I was a bit more careful with scoring, probably could have scooped up another uh, maybe three, six points. Well, really, really, no, I don't think I probably could have picked up at best another three points from feasting. So that is what it is. Uh, going into game four, this was a roller coaster of a game. I think more than any of them, this was the biggest roller coaster. So this was against a beautiful Custodes army. Uh, they won best overall, so congratulations to them. This army has actually won best overall at a couple GTs here. It, uh, it, it looks great. Maybe if I can, I'll put some pictures on it. I have some, but uh, it was a dread heavy custodies list. The faction or sub faction was always fight first and then no movement penalties to going through forests or anything like that. So it very interesting. Had to look that up. Didn't really know what the, uh, what that faction does. Cause I hadn't heard it before, but yes, four dreads were the center of this list backed up by, Trajan and a minus one to hit banner, even though it doesn't affect the term in, or the dreadnoughts. Anyway, uh, Trajan there. They had some bikes and some Venatari for things like behind enemy lines and some Sagittarium to hold back. But uh, all in all, the dreadnoughts were the center of focus. It was one venerable contemptor with the multi melt on fist, two of them with the sword and shield, like you can see here, and one of them with the big spear. Now, turn one did not go well for me. Oh, I should also mention my secondaries. I went for warp ritual, behind me lines, and banners. So turn one did not go well. I think it was borderline the worst turn one I could have possibly had. So she went first. Uh, I lost all of my tyrant guard on turn one was not anticipating it. I didn't think, you know, what guns were in rage were gonna do that, and they did. So all the Tyrant Guard were gone before I got to move. I lost, one of my Hormagon squads lost six or seven models, and that was on her turn. Oh, and I got a Carnifex that lost seven wounds on turn one. But that was that. Then we move into my part of turn one, and, my Hormagons 
failed to kill three Venatari. I had two buffed up Carnifexes and my Shard Gullet Tyrant shoot into one of her dreads with the four pin bone, but still. Uh, I only did three wounds to it in total. So that wasn't great. And then uh, my other two Carnifexes shot at her bikes and only did damage to one bike. Not great. Uh, turn two was probably more or less the same. Lost a lot more Hormigons. Pretty much was down to 19 Hormigons by that point. I had lost two Carnifexes by then and uh, not really killed anything yet. Oh, and Swarmy got tagged by Venatari and failed to kill three Venatari in his fight back. So turn two was not great. Things quickly turned around very quickly. It went from this is not going to go. Oh, and she was dominating the primary. Uh, I think the score at this point was probably some crazy like 35 to 8. Something like that at the end of turn 2. Things quickly turned around. Like I said, uh, the a Swarm Lord was the big deal. So first Trajan, the first thing that kicked off my turnaround in the game was Trajan charged my foot tyrant and failed to kill it with its two instances of fighting that it can do once per game. Uh, foot tyrant slowly whittled it down between melee, shooting, and psychic. I guess it was technically melee, psychic, shooting. Dropped Trajan there. And that really opened up the rest of the game to be good. Swarmy went to town, killing dreads, killing infantry, just doing everything on his own, uh, while the rest of the stuff really didn't kill much. I mean, yeah, they all shared the way the list, you know, performed, but if you look at Swarmy's 240 points, and I added this up kind of post-game, Swarmy killed roughly 860 points of Custodes himself. The rest of my army, you know, killed the rest of that. And even then, I think there was, I think... She had about 200, 200, 250 points still on the board at the end of the game. So take that off of there. We're looking at about 1750. There's 900-ish points that 1,250 points of my army, roughly, killed that. And then 240 points of my army killed the rest of hers. So Swarmy MVP there, just tanking wounds, dealing damage, doing rituals. Yeah. Couldn't have asked for a better Swarm Lord performance, really. So that was that one. Big, crazy turnaround. And then we get into game five. This was an exciting game because, for those of you who know and have seen some of our battle reports, I had the opportunity of playing Matt in our round five. Uh, he's the Death Guard player, so you've probably seen him. He's been on at least two battle reports. We had Tyrants versus Death Guard, and we did Grey Knights versus Death Guard recently. So if you want to see his exact list, Look at our most recent battle report versus Connor and his Grey Knights. That is the list. It has not. It did not change from there. So it was a quite exciting game. Both of us were three and one at this point. We knew one of us was going to have a top ten finish. The other of us would probably finish in the top third, roughly, depending on how the game finished out. And this this was a nail biter. Every instance of it was close. It was a very dense terrain board, again, so not a lot of shooting uh, was done. He killed a couple of my Carnifexes. I barely touched his Plague Burst Crawlers because of just how dense the terrain was. I mean, I think for a while there, my Heavy Venom Cans were shooting Plague Bears and Beasts of Nurgle. That was pretty much all they shot for the whole game. I don't think they shot a single Plague Marine or Demon... No. Death Guard unit. It was purely just shooting demon chaff the whole game. So not the best result for them, but still, uh, if you didn't, haven't seen this list, still again, check it out. But a lot of Plague Marines, big block of Death Shroud, very good characters that have fight last, turning off rerolls, all sorts of annoying stuff. Uh, and then the Nurgle Demons, which was a special demon prince, uh, Mammond, who gives rerolls to the Plague Burst Crawlers, which is very unique, but great for amping up their reliability. Plague Bears for being Plague Bears. And then two Beasts and Urgles for things like Behind Me Lines and just tar-pitting your opponent. 
Uh, he also had a bunch of pocket walkers in there. So the biggest thing that came down this game was the secondaries. That was the deciding factor. I took, I wanted to take behind me lines, but because I know this, his list very well, and I've played against this list, I also knew he wanted behind me lines. So I risked the fact that I had four secondaries I could pick from. Warp Ritual, Banners, Cranial Feasting, and Behind Me Lines. He really only had three great secondaries to take. There are some others he could have taken, but really his game plan was three secondaries. And that was two Death Guard specific, Spread the Sickness, and the... F I don't know what that one was called. Something about killing infantry or killing models with plague weapons. Very easy one for them to max out against Tyranids. And and then behind me lines. Oh, it's spread the sickness. Yes, anyway, sorry. Uh, I decided that I'm not gonna go for behind me lines, which might mean I lose potential points, but I'm gonna use my behind me lines units to screen him out from scoring behind me lines. That was, that shows or showed to be the deciding factor in this game. That difference in secondaries really came down to, I was able to pick up 10 points on behind me lines and he picked up, z or on banners, while well, he picked up zero points on behind me lines. I had positioned my stuff in such the way that I had like a pyrovore screening one corner, I had my spawned ripper unit screening another corner. I had some carnifexes screening the back line, lictors and hormigons screening the edges of my deployment zone, preventing him from getting behind me lines every single round. He tried some things to sling units into my backfield, and luckily it didn't uh, it didn't go in his favor. But had he just scored three turns of behind me lines, he would have won that game. Seven point margin. We were, I think, the last game to finish. Whenever we play, it goes back and forth. Uh, game MVP was probably the Swarm Lord. The thing that allowed me to win the game is Swarm Lord hung on through an intense fight phase on turn three by a single wound between a ton of shooting, a ton of melee. Uh, yeah, it came down to one wound that Swarm Lord hung on by. Then the other MVP, and that allowed me to do an extra ritual, have an extra model, keep him tied in combat, let my other units come in and fight after that. The other MVP might have been the Hormagots. They, against Death Guard, having poison and the ability to do mortal wounds with the psychic power and auto wounding them and being AP1, they do a good number of wounds to plague marines and even death shroud so i really did like my hormigons i did a turn one charge was able to deny him four early primary points and kill some plague marines which was a forward advancing unit that he just didn't have yes it sacrificed the hormigon squad but i think in the way my game plan was going that hormigon squad was worth denying the four points and killing a unit the other Hormagons, I mean, did some good damage to Death Shroud. I think a block of 15 killed two Death Shroud. And then the other ones did wounds to Poxwalkers and Plague Bears and stuff like that. So overall, very good there. Now, and of course, great game, Matt, if you're watching this. How's the list fair? I used to spend a lot of time on this, but I, I've used this list so many times, I don't need to go into depth with it. A all around. I love this list oh so much. Is it, do I like it more than my Kraken one, my old Kraken competitive one? I don't think so, but this is pretty close because again, this one I think requires a higher skill cap. It's not just I have bigger, powerful, more, more models than you. It is really, can you use your models more efficiently? Uh, the biggest thing I have to say here is know when to take the proper secondaries and do not know when to attack. I really, really love keeping one unit of 15 Hormagons alive until turn four or five to be that last wave push at my opponent and tip them over the edge. Every single game, 
except for the Dark Eldor one, which obviously Dark Eldor one was bad, that I was able to keep a Hormagon squad back for the end of the game. I was able to use that and sweep up a ton of points or prevent my opponent from doing a ton of damage at that time. So that's the biggest thing I have to say about this, but otherwise, I love the list. And now for some important results. Uh, first off, so if you were counting on your own, I finished 4-1, 8th place overall. Uh, the biggest thing that held me back was I had a very, very bad first, first round. Uh, and I never, I scored only over 90 points once on one of my wins. It was like 89 every time except for the loss in one game. So really bad first round it cost me the chance to be a bit higher on my list. I think if I had scored closer to 70 or 75 on a loss, I would have moved up to probably six or actually even maybe even four, but that that one game really cost me there. But overall, I had I had a great weekend. It was fun. Again, that first game was a bit disheartening, but my opponent was a great. He wasn't. Uh, he he was a great opponent, so I didn't have to worry about him just smothering me into dirt. And I had fun with it. My Neurothrope survived his entire army of shooting in melee. So. Tried to have fun where I had fun with that game. All of my opponents were great. Really had no complaints at all. As typically in our area here in Minnesota, there are very, very few people that I have complaints to get about playing against. So very happy for the community we have been building here. Uh, so yeah, eighth place. But in a way more important, so for those of you who know, ITC rankings is something done by Frontline Gaming using Best Coast Pairings. Uh, they use that to, actually I don't know if they directly take from Best Coast Pairings or the people who run the tournaments submit it to ITC. This is something I've never paid attention to. It meant, I mean, it. I'm not saying it meant nothing to me, but I just didn't really care to focus on it or really knew what it was or anything like that until this Arcs of Omen season, I thought, hey, let's pay attention to this. Let's, let's learn about this and pay attention. And essentially, you, play, you can play six games competitively in tournaments that are submitted to ITC, not games, six tournaments competitively submitted to ITC and they give you points and the points give you a ranking. And that ranking can be compared to your country, the world, um, your faction, if you play a faction, you have to play four of those six games with one faction in order to get the maximum possible score for that faction. And that's what I've done. I've played four, game, four events now with the Tyranids, not all with the same list. One of them was a behemoth one uh, from the very beginning of Arcs of Omen. And currently, as it stands, I am ranked number one globally for the Tyranid players. Uh, I don't want to take, I don't want to take too long to, I'm not trying to brag on that, but it's just like shocking at the, uh, the fact that that is the ranking that it has spit out. Now, immediately, as you can kind of look on this list, uh, the player, Evan McMillan, who is ranked number four, all he needs to do probably based on ranking is go to an RTT or a GT and finish in the top top third, and he'll probably get enough points to get over the, the point marking that I have as the top. But as it stands, I'm currently ranked number one for Tyrants in the world, and I just thought that was pretty awesome. So thank you everyone who has been uh, supporting me and listening to my content, giving me tips and tricks. There are some things in here in my list that I had not tried until some of my members had pointed out and said, you should really try this. Maybe I'm not giving it enough credit. Things like the Heavy Venom Carnifexes. Never used them. I knew they were good. Never really wanted to put too much of a spotlight on them. They worked wonders in this list. So, yeah, I just... Really, for 40k for me, it was it has been a lot of fun. Uh, I have a ton of other armies that I don't really play often, but I really, with this channel and your guys' support, have been hammering the Tyranids for the past two years now and I guess it's it's really shown so again thank you everyone who has been supporting the channel supporting me and uh, hopefully the content I give you is a is a a good way of giving back to you guys so that's everything I got I'm sure that was a long video for you guys but uh 
Thank you for watching through the whole thing. Thank you for the support. We got plenty of fun Tiernan content coming out as we are gonna be kind of stepping away from the competitive scene as, in my opinion, the competitive scene for the next month and a half doesn't really matter. It's about having fun in ninth edition until we get something new in 10th. So stay tuned to all of our 10th edition stuff coming up as well as awesome ninth edition battle reports with some big bugs and big enemies coming on the table. Thank you guys for watching and we'll catch you next time here at Mouse from Gaming Studios.